Okay, welcome guys. We're gonna start now. So first of all, greeting, namaste, Musa and selamat datang and a very good evening to all. So welcome to our Rural Surgery is Global Surgery webinar by the Global Search Network. My name is Shamlin Murgera and I'll be your moderator for today. Together with me, we have the founder and the president of GSM, Akatya Vidushi, the academic team director, Dr. Udit Katuria, and the academic team national assist, Adenia Ujeka. So today, we are really, really honored to have Dr. Ganaraj Yesudian as the speaker for this wonderful webinar. But before we begin, let me just read down some ground rules to ensure this webinar to go smoothly and present to everyone. We will be muting everyone, and we highly recommend and suggest the participants to turn on your camera throughout the session and change your background with the backdrop that has been sent to your email. Remember, we'll be having a photo session at the end of the talk. If anyone has any kind of question to the speaker, please type in, please type it out in the chat box and it will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So now this is the important thing, a link to the feedback form will be provided at the end of the talk and do fill it to make sure yourself eligible for an ESET. So last but not least, this webinar is being recorded and it is, it's been streamed live on our GSN YouTube page. So before I introduce our speaker, now allow me to welcome the founder and the president of the Global Search Network, Akatya Vidushi, for the opening remarks speech. Over to you, Akatya. Thank you, Shamlan. Uh, hello and a very good evening to everybody present here. I am Akatya. Thank you so much, Shamlan, for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, so a little bit about GSN before we begin. So the Global Search Network is basically a student-led surgical society where we aim to bridge the reach of global surgery through surgical education and training. And this webinar, which is global surgery, is rural surgery's global surgery, is just another step towards our aim and vision. And we are so grateful and honored to welcome Dr. Nanraj, sir, to, you know, give his precious time to us for this webinar. Thank you so much, sir, for doing this for us. And I would also like to extend a great heartfelt congratulations to the Academy team for pulling out this workshop amazingly. So thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great webinar ahead. Uh, over to you, Shamlan. Thank you, Akatya, for that wonderful uh, opening remarks. Now, allow me to introduce our main speaker for today, Dr. Ganraj Jesudian. Dr. Ganraj Jesudian, MS, MCH, Urology, FICS, FIA, GS, FERSI. He is graduated from CMC Valor, and he has been working in rural areas and remote areas for the last four decades. He has been performed over 100,000 surgical procedures and helped 63 hospitals in rural areas to start minimally invasive surgeries. He is the past president of the Association of Rural Surgeons of India and the secretary of International Federation of Rural Surgeons and the board member of the G4 Alliance. He has more than 400 publications in national and international journals and few innovation awards and patents. He is currently working on gas insufflation less laparoscopic surgeries and training with laptop cystoscope. And now, without further ado, let us dive into the webinar. Over to you, Dr. Ganaraj. Thank you for the introductions and uh, welcome this evening to the seminar. I'll just start sharing my screen. Share some. Okay. Today we're going to talk about uh, rural surgery or global surgery. Why do we say both are the same? Because uh, most of global area is uh, rural. The Association of Rural Surgeons of India. We're going to uh, start with a small uh, two-minute video, which will introduce the uh, Association of Rural Surgeons of India. And then we'll proceed. The Association of Rural Surgeons of India is a group of brilliant surgeons who work among the rural areas, serving the poor and the marginalized. 
there were many innovations that were made by the rural surgeons to serve the poor and the marginalized. And one of them, the use of mosquito net for tension-free honey repair, is listed as one of the six famous and effective low-cost innovations for surgery by the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization also included the gas encephalationless laparoscopic surgical equipment as part of the WHO compendium of innovative medical devices for resource poor setting. The gasless laparoscopic surgeries, or GILS in short, was developed to meet the needs of the patients in rural and remote areas. It makes laparoscopic surgeries possible under spinal anesthesia at a very low cost. The association was instrumental in starting DNB course in rural surgery and to get it recognized by the Medical Council of India. They also offer fellowship in rural surgery. Recently, they started a variety of uh, certificate level courses with the innovative online on-site training format. The annual conference of the association attracted many overseas delegates and this resulted in formation of the International Federation of Rural Surgeons. These are two YouTube channels where training videos are posted for the rural surgeons and also patient education videos for the rural patients. The association also arranges workshops to teach innovative gasless surgical techniques and other low cost innovations like uh, the just external fixator system or rural urology using the laptop cystoscope. All you need to do is to connect the scope to the laptop computer and start doing these diagnostic scopies or minor procedures. Thanks to the impact and success of the model in empowering the rural surgeons, many who are interested in global surgeries have pitched in to help. Okay. So why do you call uh, rural surgery or global surgery an important uh, public health problem? A couple of years ago, the, the World Health Organization did not really bother about uh, surgical diseases. Even though they found about one third of the global surgical problem. Because everybody thought surgeries were very expensive and it's out of reach of most of the people. And we really can't do much uh, or it doesn't offer much of a benefit. But on the other hand, there were a group of us who felt that surgery is much more important than uh, the other so called uh, public health uh, for which WHO is spending plenty of money. For example, uh, the, even though it is, uh, in the, like, if we take a disease like HIV, there are plenty of uh, funding which goes into it. And uh, it, um, the patients live only about uh, 10 to 15 years, even if they receive ART. And uh, continuous uh, interventions are necessary to take care of them. On the other hand, uh, many of the surgical diseases, just with one intervention, you can uh, completely treat them and they can go back to normal productive work. You'll be in it's interesting to know that uh, some African countries, almost uh, six to 10% of the entire male population there have hernia. And uh, quite a significant amount of them go into complications and uh, have problems. So just one small surgical intervention there can uh, save a lot of money and uh, heartache and problems. And that is why a few years ago, in 2018, WHO recognized surgical disease as a global disease. And then once it uh, becomes a global uh, disease, then you need to make sure that it's equally available to all the people all across the world, which is in fact uh, quite a problem because uh, the unlike uh, many of the medical interventions, surgical intervention need a team. They need uh, anesthesiologists, we need uh, nurses and the OR team. So we go through the world statistics, as I mentioned briefly earlier, 30% of the global disease burden is surgical. And uh, even though Lancet estimated that we need about uh, 5,000 surgical procedures for every one lakh population, many of the poor nations uh, can hardly afford to have this. Even in a country like India, 
the national average only about 800. And some of the places where I used to work in Northeast India, it is uh, as little as uh, 30 to 50 per surgical procedures per one lakh uh, population. So the need for surgical procedures is really, really great. And the capacity is very limited, especially in the, the LMICs of poor countries. Even though in high income countries, there are 14 operating theaters for one lakh population. There are less than one in most of the LMICs. And in uh, rural areas, the remote areas is uh, even worse. And as I fixed uh, most of the surgeons or surgical workforce, they choose to work in uh, urban areas and not in uh, rural areas. This is more true even for anesthetists, even though some surgeons might actually go and uh, live and work in uh, rural areas. It's very difficult to find the anesthesiologists working in rural areas. So the there are many I mean, projects, even simple things like uh, the surgical safety checklist, which uh, the WHO produced, can very significantly improve the quality of uh, surgical care. Because uh, most of the rural areas, because they are neglected, they don't really concentrate on quality. They just uh, are interested in uh, doing as many as uh, possible rather than uh, concentrating on quality, which significantly makes the improvement in productivity. So if we look at the analysis of uh, the surgical workforce, which includes uh, surgeons, anesthesiologists, obstetricians, and so on. As the number of this workforce increases, the, there is decrease in mortality or uh, the more surgical workers you have, more people survive because they're able to get the surgical diseases uh, treated. And the optimum level, if you look at the graph, this is about 20. And uh, as you expect in many of the Western countries, they have about 40 to 60 per 1 lakh population. While in uh, India, it's only about uh, 6 or 7. And again, the, this is another thing which is the Lancet has analyzed and <laughs> shown. The life expectancy obviously will increase if you're able to provide the surgical, meet the surgical need, which is about 5,000 per 1 lakh population. Although there are many other factors which contribute the, to the life expectancy, meeting the surgical need is a very significant uh, one, because uh, many of the emergency surgical procedures not carried out, uh, patients die. And uh, more importantly, especially in uh, rural areas and LMICs, surgical disease uh, causes catastrophic uh, expenses, which nobody plans or saves money. And then uh, to meet the expenses, they need to either sell the assets they have, like land or cows or whatever it is, and which pushes them into poverty. This is about 90% in uh, India, I mean 40% in India, and it's much higher than many other African countries. So this is because uh, it's not the government which pays for it, and most of the poorer countries, the patients have to pay for the surgical treatment. And the uh, Lancet, uh, they did a big study and uh, they established these uh, six indicators, which will tell how good or how competent is the surgical care providers in uh, the various uh, countries, which I mean, the, mainly depends on how often, how long do they take to access it, the surgical volume, the surgeon workforce uh, density and the catastrophic expenses and so on. So when you go to the rural areas, there are three primary problems uh, as far as uh, surgery is concerned. One is the accessibility. And next is the availability and the thirdly, the affordability. This picture you can see, 
this is one of the most uh, common way they carry the patients they have a bamboo stick and a bed sheet and the patient is here and a couple of years ago we went to a place in arunachal so we were helping one of the junior doctors there with the teaching him how about various surgical procedures then we went to one place uh, where there are about 4000 people who were living there called lada and to reach the place we had to drive for about 17 hours and then walk for 10 hours so imagine if uh, somebody needs uh, acute appendicitis I mean has appendicitis and needs surgery or uh, if uh, somebody needs a uh, cesarean section imagine them walking for 10 hours and then traveling by road for another 17 hours to reach the place but again even if they reach the surgical centers we can't say that uh, all these surgeries could be possible in that place because uh, sometimes uh, they are possible some places they are not possible and even if they are available and the facilities are there unless it's affordable to many of them it's not of uh, much use so these are some of the things that uh, we did so we started arranging what we call uh, diagnostic camps in rural areas so what we used to do is take all the diagnostic procedures that we have like the gastroscope the cystoscope the entire lab ultrasound to the remote areas this we did because we realized that people don't travel for more than 5 uh, kilometers for accessing opd services for example if they have abdominal pain if it were ultrasound you know whether they have a gallstone or renal stone which uh, causes the pain but if they don't get it done nobody knows uh, why the pain occurs and the patients are not willing to travel more than 10 I mean 5 kilometers to get an ultrasound done and in now many of the northeastern states when you worked uh, about a decade ago they need to travel 100 or 150 kilometers to a place where they can have an ultrasound done so that is the reason why we took uh, all these i mean facilities to the people and i mean the picture you can see how difficult the terrain is even for a healthy group of uh, medical people to travel it's quite difficult then imagine how a patient has to travel all these things they have to come to the town or city for these diagnostics and we realized that 75% of the patients were diagnosed for the first time during these uh, diagnostic camps then how do you make them available see the whatever we need to do has to be very portable because we have to take everything to the villages and then uh, general anesthesia i'm sure you'll re- realize that is very very difficult in uh, remote areas we need gases for anesthesia we need anesthesiologists and the medicine that we need are pretty expensive so it has to be done under spinal anesthesia which is fairly easily available and uh, many can be easily learned by many people so we developed uh, surgeries which are possible under spinal anesthesia here the picture what you see is uh, how we started diagnostic laparoscopics before we got the laparoscopy equipment because i am a urologist we had the cystoscope so we used the cystoscope for diagnosis we had a bp cuff for inflating and having pneumoperitoneum and we can do simple things like uh, take biopsies and uh, make the di- in addition to make uh, the diagnosis thank you i think this is one video it is important for surgical patients in rural and remote areas to get back to work as soon as possible minimally invasive surgeries like laparoscopic surgeries make this possible however the high cost the logistic nightmare of providing gases for both anesthesia and surgery and finding as an anesthesiologist in rural areas means that laparoscopic surgeries are not available to 90% of the rural population who need them the most important step to provide laparoscopic surgeries in rural areas starts with making laparoscopic surgeries possible under the easily available 
and low cost spinal anesthesia. The gas and circulation less laparoscopic surgeries, gills and short, makes this possible under spinal anesthesia. Laparoscopic surgeries are carried out by passing instruments through small incisions and looking inside the abdomen using a telescope and camera. The insufflation of gas distance the abdomen and makes space for using the instruments to carry out the surgeries. The gas also pushes away the intestines that come in the way. Unfortunately, the gas increases the abdominal pressure and also gets absorbed. These cause physiological changes that calls for experienced anesthesiologists to manage. The gill surgeries are performed using special equipment to lift the abdominal wall so that necessary space could be created to carry out the surgical procedure. And the positioning of the patient uses gravity to move the intestines away from the surgical field. The laparoscopic surgeries became popular in the late 80s, but by early 90s, several attempts were made to produce gasless uh, laparoscopic surgical equipment. This is to avoid the physiological changes that occur with gases, especially in patients with comorbidities and those who need uh, prolonged uh, laparoscopic surgery. However, poor exposure and the problem of tenting with the early devices, even with the motorized devices, made it difficult to perform these surgeries. Hence, most of the publications which are there are from single centers using their own uh, equipment. Dr. Hashimoto is considered the father of gasless laparoscopy surgeries and the various devices that you can see in the background illustrates the problem of stenting and poor exposure despite the various motorized capabilities. The first device which uh, sort of gave an exposure was similar to the conventional laparoscopy surgery, the abdominal lift device for Dr. Daniel Krasinski. There were modifications of this in the second generation equipment and so on. And uh, we got this uh, device made, which gave us uh, almost uh, as good an exposure, especially the BMI is less than 28. And it is very easy to use in remote areas. It took about a decade to develop a device with reasonable exposure. In Germany, it was uh, especially been promoted to prevent post-operative additions, which occur because uh, use of uh, dry gas, which is uh, also cause hypothermia. And uh, these uh, prevention of additions and the physiological advantages were used to advantage in gasless surgeries. In recent times, the rural surgeons have been using gasless surgeries working on modification with the primary purpose of taking laparoscopic surgeries to rural and remote areas. It has the advantage of easier learning curve compared to the conventional surgeries. The possibility of using techniques which they're familiar with for open surgeries and also using some of the open surgical instruments in addition to the capability of performing them under the easily available uh, spinal anesthesia. It also has other advantages. There's less pain and less infection. The ho short hospital stay means that more surgeries are possible with the limited resources in rural areas and also allows uh, visiting teams to perform uh, laparoscopic surgeries in rural areas. The importance of minimally invasive surgery was so much in rural areas that we performed uh, diagnostic laparoscopies using the cystoscope. Diagnostic laparoscopy with cystoscope. The positioning of the patient is guided by the possible diagnosis. In this patient with low esophageal cancer, the patient has placed supine with the legs separated and the head then slightly elevated. The umbilicus is held up with a towel clip 
and a small incision is made below the umbilicus. The taut rectus is divided with the electrocord free and a small opening is made into the peritoneal cavity. The cystoscope is introduced through the opening and the interiors could be visualized. The blood pressure cuff could be used for creating pneumoperitoneum if an encephalator is not available. Biopsies could be taken using the flexible biopsy forceps. In liver biopsies, it's better than even the biopsy gun because only superficial tissues are biopsied and cauterization of bleeding point could be carried out using a locally made electrocauterization probe similar to the Bugby electrode. In case of evaluation of infertility, it's a very useful tool. The patency of the tubes could be studied by injecting methylene blue dye. The cystoscope was also used for carrying out small elective procedures like appendicectomies. You might wonder why not make traditional laparoscopic surgery is less expensive. We did try. We used ether and EMO machine to reduce the cost of anesthesia. And then air from dental compressor for encephalation. However, these are not the ideal procedures. The stand laparoscopic positioner was developed to use in rural areas. It's easy to use and the exposure of it is not inferior to the conventional laparoscopic surgeries. In fact, a randomized control style carried out in Maulana Asad Medical College showed that for BMI less than 28, there's no difference. In fact, the, the gill surgeries were a little quicker. What is the impact of these uh, gasless surgeries? Over 1,500 laparoscopic surgeries were carried out in rural and remote areas under spinal anesthesia. And several rural surgeons were able to learn this technique. And many are still continuing to do these surgeries on their own. They do surgeries like cholecystectomies, appendicectomies, hysterectomies, ovarian cystectomies. And most of the pelvic surgeries are carried out using gills. A formal training program was developed by the University of Leeds that includes an innovative proctorship program. A second generation of uh, device was also developed by the Leeds team using frugal participatory development process. Now we'll talk a little more about this. Hence, the gills or gases laparoscopic surgery is an ideal procedure to take laparoscopic surgery or minimum. Okay, I think uh, this would have shown you how we can modify things to make uh, surgeries uh, possible in rural areas. Because uh, laparoscopic surgeries or minimally invasive surgeries are more relevant actually for the rural population. The urban colleagues can uh, take one month or two months off after surgery without any hassles or problems. On the other hand, the rural patients, most often they are breadwinners. And uh, if they take off for a few days, then the entire family suffers. So that is uh, important uh, for carrying out these minimally invasive surgeries. And the way forward is to have a research which is specifically directed to these and making surgery possible under spinal anesthesia. And of course, uh, you just notice that uh, we use fairly expensive equipment there. You've seen the handles that you use for vessel sealing and so on. And these are actually possible because uh, we have tie-ups with, uh, with an organization like International Aid who donate all these uh, equipment. So that is the reason why we're able to, and uh, visiting surgeons who come and help us, they often bring these equipment along with them. And the big advantage we had with the proctorship program is that we're able to train the surgeons at their place with the, whatever they have. What it does is that it will make them continue to do the surgeries so that even if you leave the place, uh, the patients get the benefit. So we, in one of the I mean, organizations we worked earlier, they sent many of the local doctors to I mean, uh, earlier to the Western countries, then later to big medical colleges to learn laparoscopic surgeries. But unfortunately, after they came back, they were not able to replicate the same thing in the local rural hospital. Because uh, whatever said and then uh, the local rural hospital theater cannot be similar to a medical college theater or a Western theater. And whatever you learn in that setting, unless you make a lot of 
small small modifications you may not be able to replicate it in the rural area and that is why we think that uh, proctorship is important where you go and train the surgeon at the local place another disadvantage is that when the rural surgeon go off to urban areas they are tempted to often stay back in the urban areas and not only for laparoscopic surgery even for kidney surgeries I mean, uh, we did an analysis in a uh, place in Uttarakhand. We found that uh, almost uh, five to six percent of the OPD patients, this is in a very remote areas at the foothills of the Himalayas, have urology problems. And uh, as you would expect, 98 percent of them are not able to go and have a treatment from urologists. And quite often, even simple things, the uretic stones on both sides can lead to renal failure and uh, acute renal failure and uh, patients die. The treatment is very simple to do a small procedure called uh, DJ stenting. So the need is uh, tremendous in rural areas and the possibilities are quite uh, massive. So we developed all these uh, techniques, like uh, we modified uh, the ureterinoscopic uh, surgery or with the prayer stenting, which makes the ureter wide, so that with the scope, we can go right up to the kidney and break the stones and uh, take it. So it just happens in two, three sittings, but then uh, it is less expensive and possible right at the doorstep in the, or the very remote areas. And similarly, prostate surgeries, instead of uh, cutting it and uh, removing it, we used to use the vaporization technique. So now people are switched over to laser because it's more expensive and uh, trying to promote it. Vaporization does exactly the same thing and is far less expensive. And uh, we use uh, equipment which is made for urology and for other things also. Like for instance, uh, the ureterinoscope. You know, they can notice this is a fallopian tube. So we can use the ureter endoscope to relieve blocks in the fallopian tube. And this will help um, in, in one of the places in uh, Northeast India where we did the study. Almost 19% of the infertile couples, they were able to conceive after this uh, procedure. So the... Earlier, you had a few questions of uh, how to learn or uh, where do you go for learning uh, rural surgery. So one of the things I briefly mentioned in the video is that we have a IFRS as a YouTube channel where we are trying to upload these various uh, education uh, videos. So it has about uh, 60, about 50 in each. And then for rural urology practice, there is a website called uh, one dot surgery. If you go to academy dot uh, one dot surgery, then you'll find this uh, free online course. So you can uh, do it. And then we try empowering the rural surgeons by going by the proctorship method that we have talked about. We go to the rural surgeons, teach them and uh, visit them regularly once a month or once in two months till they're able to learn how to do these uh, I mean, modern uh, surgical procedures. And once they're confident, we move to the next place. And uh, another important thing is to make the laparoscopic surgeries or any surgical procedures available or affordable to the rural population. How do you do it? So initially, before we got I mean, hold of the gasless apparatus, we were using, uh, we tried using ether and uh, EMO machine, which uh, reduces the cost of uh, medicine that you use for general anesthesia. But still, the logistics of providing gases for both anesthesia and uh, surgery is quite difficult for laparoscopic surgery. And that is the reason why I shifted to gasless uh, surgeries. Then we had a lot of uh, innovative methods of financing. For instance, uh, in some of the villages in Mizoram where they needed elective surgeries, the local church and uh, people got together, donated a piglet to them. 
and when the piglet grew they were able to sell it and come with the money for elective surgeries to the hospital then we had these insurance uh, programs where the local grocery shopkeepers they manage this uh, program they they of course have a knack of uh, regularly collecting money from the patients and they used to advance the money which is necessary for them and the same uh, grocery shops they used for providing uh, medicine they require regularly because uh, this is one way of uh, delivering medicines to these uh, remote areas then we made a lot of adaptations uh, to reduce the cost like if you're doing a laparoscopic appendicectomy you can easily buy a endoloop and uh, use it on the other hand you can also make a low cost endoloop with the proline suture which costs a small fraction of the cost that you would buy and uh, this is a small video we learned about, about the bladder pressure studies and uh, cystoscopy we said that uh, most of the urology problems could be diagnosed using these two simple methods unfortunately the way they are carried out at present make them very expensive and out of reach of uh, most of the patients in rural areas about 4000 people live in and around ladai in arunachal pradesh it took us 17 hours drive and 10 hours to walk to reach this place from the nearest town where surgical care is possible during the diagnostic camps we saw over 400 patients and about 3% of them had urinary tract stones do you think it would be possible to treat these patients in such remote areas where there is no electricity yes is the answer now thanks to this laptop cystoscope all you need to do is to connect the scope to the laptop computer and start doing these diagnostic scopies or minor procedures earlier we saw how the okay the even uh, last week we went to place remote area in jharkhand we were able to do about uh, 12 such uh, procedures uh, last week and this is uh, investment is a very small one only 50000 for the entire scope and all you need is a laptop computer you don't even need a passos on the other hand if you need to do a conventional cystoscopy you will need a cystoscope a telescope which costs about 3 lakhs the cystoscopy sheath bridge the light source and uh, if you're not used to been uh, directly having a look inside the telescope then you need a camera which will cost 5 to 8 lakhs and so on so we need to work out ways of uh, dramatically decreasing the cost of uh, treatment and then uh, as uh, you saw in the previous videos you also can uh, make adaptations to make the surgeries uh, low cost or as uh, minimally invasive as possible using the various knowledge that you have from the regular surgical work for instance uh, I mean, there is a very expensive equipment we can use for minimally invasive treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome it's a specially designed equipment and uh, as expected it will cost about 20 25 lakhs but the same thing can be performed with the ordinary I mean, neurology instrument that we use for cutting the structures and we can use uh, video inguinal block dissection is a separate method of uh, doing minimally invasive surgery for uh, ileal inguinal block dissection when we normally do because the lymphatics are not sealed you have I mean, quite a bit of morbidity you have uh, oozing a lymph and the patient has to stay for almost a month with this method uh, the wound healing so good that uh, they can be discharged like any other other patient with uh, small incisions and there is a question about what happens when uh, surgery don't go as uh, planned this is a uh, important thing you need uh, means one of the used to be one of the problem earlier because uh, 
lack of mentorship is what is difficult to get in rural areas you can't if there's an emergency you can't talk to anybody you can't call anyone and uh, nobody will be there to come and help but now the lockdown has changed a lot of things we are able to talk through zoom we are able to do zoom assisted procedures or so when somebody is trying to do a procedure in rural area i can watch and guide them from here so this picture shows one of the interesting when you are doing a urology procedure suddenly even though we had a backup generators the power supply failed the backup generator also failed then uh, here we have one of the nurses using the chinese <laughs> torch which is quite powerful for light and then uh, we also had uh, i mean uh, of course uh, one problem with the modern equipment is that it involves a lot of power supply earlier if you doing open surgery you can use candlelight or torchlight to complete the surgery so here we even uh, in, uh, since we had finished most of the dissection and appendicectomy we were able to use the ordinary cell phone to complete the surgery here when there is no gas you can uh, i mean uh, this is the earlier days when you were doing laparoscopic surgery when you ran out of gas we were using the nitrous oxide from the anesthesia machine for encephalization so you need to start uh, making lot of adaptations if you are working in rural areas but it is much easier now because uh, you can always call people who are experienced who had uh, dealt with these problems earlier you can always call them and ask them and uh, because with zoom you can actually see what is happening there and uh, give them the necessary advice so how is uh, rural surgery different from regular surgery see one is that uh, you come try to combine the advantages of uh, the various uh, modern surgery for example uh, means minimally invasive surgeries for thyroid to prevent a uh, scar they start uh, incision in the axilla then go up to the thyroid here and dissect but we can use the same uh, principle by making a small incision and using the instruments for dissecting the thyroid or if you are doing a gg vagotomy you can do laparoscopic uh, vagotomy and make a small uh, muscle splitting incision to do the gastrogenostomy instead of uh, using the expensive staplers and the same thing we you do for renal surgery with a huge stone and there are multiple stones any incision in the kidney will bleed not just during the surgery even after 2 weeks uh, they can have dramatic bleeding because of secondary infection or secondary bleed so we can pass the scopes that are available through the urinary pelvis at open surgery and then remove the stone fragments and search for them and the same thing like uh, the instead of the various uh, modern techniques for fistula and ano we can use the same minimally invasive techniques using the ureter rhinoscope and then we also work as a team in fact uh, many of the procedures like systematogram or urodynamic studies and the scopies are carried out during these uh, in surgical camps by nurses and i have the screen in front of me so that uh, i know what is happening and i can give them the necessary advice based on that and then many of the rural hospitals uh, we have people who are trained as anesthetists doing the surgeries because uh, they have uh, been seen a variety of surgeries and uh, finally what we need to do is uh, we need to have specific research which is directed towards uh, helping rural areas like uh, we developed this uh, I mean if you have a topical vacuum therapy the ready made machines uh, the expensive ones are about 20 30 lakhs while the cheap chinese ones cost about uh, 10 to 12 lakhs but if you make it from scratch it costs only about uh, 20 30 000 rupees the same thing and uh, you can achieve the same results again if you don't have oxygen you can use the oxygen concentrator with a co compressor to do the desired uh, flow so now uh, coming to the 
pros and cons of uh, rural surgery? That's one of the questions that uh, you had sent, I mean, people had sent uh, prayer. So what are the pros? I mean, you can do a wide variety of surgeries. Even, I mean, like uh, in the beginning, I mean, uh, you mentioned that I had done almost uh, 100,000 surgeries. I had operated almost uh, any surgery which belonged to most of the fields. I had done evacuation, extradural hemorrhage. I had done cataract surgeries. I had done close mitral valotomy. I had done, uh, I mean, uh, uh, partial I mean, uh, replacements, then uh, radial forearm flap. And uh, of course, I'm a urologist, so I do a lot of urology, I do pediatric surgery, rohemals, and so on. This is possible only because I was working in a rural area where you can't have uh, specializations. You need to do whatever patient comes and you need to be able to do it. Even if I stayed back in Velour or some other big center, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn such a variety of surgeries. And the other thing is, uh, one of the I mean, problems or uh, myths is that if you go to rural area, you can't be involved in academics and uh, you cannot do well, which is also not true. Because I had uh, almost uh, 400 publications and uh, and these, uh, I, mean, I would say is fairly good journal because uh, I have more than 500 citations from these uh, publications. And uh, the other big advantage is that somebody wanted to know about the cost or how much can you Earn. The interesting thing is that uh, how, I mean, how much away you earn really doesn't matter because it uh, everything is relative. So recently I was uh, passing through Bombay and I saw the advertisement which saying that the costs are dramatically reduced about uh, the cost of flats. It's only 3.5 crores for a one-room flat in uh, Bombay. If you had 3.5 crores in a rural area, you can build a huge mansion and uh, live like a king in that area. And while if you had the same amount of money in uh, Bombay, you'd be, you'd be staying in a small flat. And same thing, there are a lot of people who go abroad and uh, for sake of money. They have been earning or whatever it is relative to the rest of the people, which will always be low. On the other hand, if you're working, choose to work in a rural area, you're really, I mean, whatever you earn, you're much more than the rest of the people around. And it gives you a status also, like uh, in many of the places where we worked, they even make the planes wait for you 10, 15 minutes so that you can <laughs> come and board it. You're treated like a big VIP. So it's not a big uh, deal that uh, you will earn less money if you work in rural areas. And it's quite, man, uh, unlike earlier, nowadays it's easy to sort of contact seniors and uh, learn watching YouTubes. We don't know how to do surgeries or uh, have somebody supervising through Zoom and so on. It's much more interesting and much more easier to learn. So if you look at the Cons, then one thing I really did notice was that sometimes the work can become a little too much because there's so much work around. And uh, in the, one of the reasons I left the hospital, I was working in Northeast, was we were doing about 20, 25 major surgeries in a day, every day, five to six days a week. And then uh, another real drawback may be the children's education because uh, you won't have good schools and other facilities there. But otherwise, it's a very good option for younger people to consider because uh, you can do much, much more than what you would be able to do in an urban area. So, and uh, there is enough you can do in rural areas, both in academics, in terms of work, in terms of satisfaction, in terms of status. It's a very wise and good choice to make. I think it's almost 15 minutes, so we can stop here and take questions. Thank you. Sure, Doctor. 
So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ganaraj, for the very insightful presentation and, and those wonderful innovations. We are, I believe that all of us are really impressed with those. And definitely we have learned a lot about global surgery and how does it like related to rural surgery. And I believe like in today's world, when we talk about laptop, it's all about playing games. We browse a lot and we also use it for to access a lot of information. And it's actually mind blowing to know that laptop actually been used as one of the surgical procedure in rural areas. So now I think we shall move to the Q&A session. To all the participants, if you have any question, please type it in the chat box. So far, there's no question. So, Doctor, can we go to the pre-event questions? Yeah. So, there are, there are a few interesting questions I feel should be addressed now. So, the first question is that, yes, we 3D printing, 3D printing critical instruments on site have the present scenario of making available basic surgical instrument for lesser price. But again, the problem with the 3D printing is that the machines are pretty expensive. They are very useful for in the design stage. So when uh, see when we design the uh, in the equipment for the gasless surgeries. So we were very I mean uh, we had to be very very critical of making any changes in the beginning because uh, it involves various molds for making the metal pieces. On the other hand, if you're able to make these changes with the 3D printer, and then once you finalize, then you can make the molds for making the equipment. So in research, it does help. And of course, if you have, we need to make custom made processes and those sort of things, it helps. But otherwise, the regular instruments, I don't know whether how much uh, for cost uh, effectiveness will be there in using 3D printing technology for rural surgery. Yeah, doctor. So there's another question they ask how to ex expertise in suturing without buying expensive suture learning kits from market. Okay, I'll tell, uh, I'll tell you to go, go to go to the YouTube channel. See, so we <laughs> have if you go to the this thing, there is a uh, one uh, video on uh, how to practice on a simulator. So there we are shown how even if you don't have it in the simulator, because this is during the lockdown period. So you can use a cardboard uh, box and this uh, camera from the cell phone to practice. And the various techniques of uh, suturing, five, six different types of way of uh, suturing is uh, taught there. So you can use the ordinary material which is available for practicing laparoscopic surgery and uh, this thing. Even the, you know, the FLS, they have these courses and uh, certification program for training in laparoscopic surgery. The same task, we have modified it to using the ordinary available things, where they have these uh, I mean, uh, things to practicing how to remove the appendix or tie an appendix. Even those things, you'll have to buy those uh, things, what they use for, for the simulator. But instead of that, you can use an ordinary glove, you can pack it with gauze piece and uh, practice uh, when, uh, removing the appendix and so on. So there are a lot of ways of uh, simple, low-cost methods of practicing on uh, simulators. Another thing we have done is uh, we have developed a new needle for laparoscopic suturing where the suture comes from the tip. The biggest problem in uh, laparoscopic suturing is that it's easy to pass the needle. Once you release the needle holder, then uh, everything goes off uh, in a different direction. So it's very difficult to take it out and pull it and tie the knots. So here, when we just ran, the, again, it keeps rotating because it's uh, cylindrical. So we have a flat tip. It's easy to hold and manipulate. And the, what all you need to do in suturing is pass the thread from one end to the other end through the tissues. So if you have the needle in the tip, it's easy to do suturing. That is also, in my own thing, we added that video in the YouTube channel. It will soon be doing it. 
Thank you very much, Doctor. So I believe all the uh, all the rural surgeons are the best innovators from my perspective. So, so Doctor, this, there are a few. Yeah, there, there is few one question about. about uh, see the. Uh, Omez, so one of the thing you need to realize uh, the balance when you're doing um, uh, treating malignancy in rural areas is that you need to strike a balance between safety and uh, adventure. So because I mean, uh, I mean, the first primary thing is to save the patient. You don't want a dead patient in the table. So we do sometimes uh, compromise on uh, the completeness of the removal. See, I mean, uh, come, I mean, a couple of, uh, I mean, this days ago, the, one of the patients we had done uh, operated where we removed a 12 kilo renal tumor. But then uh, the classic thing is you need to, wherever it's stuck to the inferior vena cava, we need to remove the part of the vena, vena cava with the tumor out. But then we didn't want to do such a thing in a remote area. So we left behind tumor in the vena cava and a few other places. But then we did uh, remove the bulk of the tumor. But then uh, we know that it will recur. And um, uh, only when the malignant tissue becomes generally, the rule of the thumb is that if the malignant tissue is more than one kilo in the body, then it's incompatible with life. So as long as you keep the recurrences small and keep treating the recurrences, the patient will survive. So this patient, uh, I thought we had operated only three years ago, but he said uh, five years ago we had treated him, promoted 12 kilo tumor. But he's still alive and he's still quite happy. He came to see a few days ago. So even if you compromise a little bit on the margins and so on, it still does help uh, in rural areas. Thank you for that answer, uh, Dr. Ganadaj, and thanks for sharing your experience. So there's another question saying, in rural yeah. setting, how is yeah, about, it septic? Uh, See, one of the thing is that uh, one big advantage we have in a uh, rural area is that it's, uh, I mean, uh, you don't need as much uh, aseptic techniques as in uh, cities or urban areas because uh, two things. One is that uh, you don't have so much uh, nosocomial infections or bacteria which are resistant to many of the medicines. In fact, the first uh, place that I worked was in... Uh, Dance districts of Gujarat. For that uh, tribal population, about uh, two and a half lakhs, there are not a single MBBS doctor in that whole area. So we had one, I mean, uh, one of the staff who was uh, stuck by lightning. He had 85% burns. And even in CMC Valor, any burns about 60%, uh, we can't guarantee the survival. The, Mortality is very high. Here it healed without any problem. We were able to, we had a special uh, skin grafting in, uh, apparatus where you can take graft from anywhere. So we did so many times uh, skin grafting and so on. He survived uh, and he got married. He has three children now <laughs> without any much, I mean, without much problem because the infection was very, very less there. And same thing, recently we had uh, people from Delft University in uh, Netherlands come and uh, study the various sterile techniques that we use for laparoscopic surgery in rural areas. And it is interesting that uh, even though many of the actual complete sterile techniques are not followed, the infection rate is almost the same or even less in the rural areas because of uh, less chance of nosocomial in infection. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ganraj. So there's another question by Dr. Udi. So, so do we use more antibiotics in rural areas as compared to urban areas? More prophylactic antibiotics are involved? See, most of the time, because we're concerned about the sterile techniques and uh, sterility, we always use uh, prophylactic antibiotics. And the, 
another advantage we have is that many of the rural population especially in tribal areas they would not have had these uh, antibiotics earlier and in the surrounding areas there are not many doctors who prescribe these uh, antibodies so the resistant to these medicines are uh, less and again we use uh, try and use the low cost early generation antibiotics uh, which again uh, is not used in urban areas they use the more expensive newer ones and the resistance is more often to them than to the older generation ones thank you very much thank dr rajesh i hope that answers your question dr vidit katuria to all the participants we still have few more minutes for q and a session if you have any question please drop it in the q and in the chat box so dr while waiting for them let's go back to the some pre event questions so this one question they ask uh, can rural can rural residency years provide the same competence confidence and diverse array of surgical disease see the you know the rural surgery training program is not there only in india they have a rural surgery training program in uk the royal college of surgeon surgeon bro there's one in canada and the duration of training is almost 12 years in them <laughs> because they make them go through a variety of specialties so because uh, unlike general surgery or uh, gynecology and so on orthopedics they stick to their specialty but uh, rural surgery you need to learn all the specialties and that is why their training program is uh, much longer so now uh, there are a group of uh, people who uh, taken the initiative to arrange them I mean, uh, programs and to posting in various rural hospital few few months so that they go around for Two three years as long as they want to learn whatever is possible at various places. Because each place has a different type of or uh, different group of uh, surgical disease which are managed there. Thank you, doctor. So, doctor, we are almost come to the end of the webinar. But before that, I would like to ask one question, to doctor. So, um, because we know, like a lot of people, a lot of medical graduates, they are not really explore this uh, rural. areas because they are not really interested in 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 exploring this rural uh, areas to to continue their internship so can doctor give a few words why and why we should as a medical graduate explore this area of surgery see as i said uh, earlier many of them have the fear that uh, okay one you will not make enough money one you will not uh, learn more or you'll uh, lack academics and uh, again uh, you will not uh, have any mentors or uh, the various uh, things that you will enjoy in a urban area so as is so do all these uh, actually myths nowadays because uh, we can get uh, almost whatever is available in urban area even in smaller towns if you go to small town they have all the that and everything which is available is possible and uh, again uh, earnings is relative so if you go to a rural area you'll be <laughs> on one of the top earners uh, compared to the rest of the people around and academics uh, especially for I mean, uh, both for learning and for publications it's easier because you have less competition See many of the, I mean, some I mean, like earlier, some of the big journals, Lancet and the uh, American Journal of uh, Surgery and the British Journal of Urology and all. Even though the what you write may not be up to that uh, quality in the way of writing and analysis and all, the editors are actually because it's coming from a rural area, they rewrote the article and published it. well uh, if you are doing the same thing from a medical college or urban center they will simply reject it so you have an advantage there again uh, i told you i was able to do so many different uh, specialty surgeries in rural area so if you are sitting in a urban area nobody is going to teach you because they think you will become a competition to them but because you are working in a rural area they are willing to come and teach i'll just pass off with one example you know uh, 
when we started doing uh, fund application laparoscopic fund application a senior doctor from vello he had gone to australia and learned the technique and came and he came to the rural hospital and taught me how to do fund application before he taught anybody else in cmc vello because there you get menil it comes in turns you need to do i mean certain be a certain senior level and uh, once they start doing a fair number of the thing only they can teach well here there is no competition they, they can come and straight away teach so it's actually advantages to work in a rural area than in an urban area i would think so uh thank you very much yeah. dr gandesh for those words and for delivering this webinar and clearing all of our doubts so to all the participants who have come to the end of this webinar so for that i would like to welcome the gsn academy team director dr udit kathuria for closing remarks speech over to you dr udit kathuria thank you shamla we have reached the end of oral surgery is global surgery and it is my task to provide some closing remarks it is a sad task because we will be bidding goodbyes however it is also a privilege and honor at a gathering of such great doctors from different parts of the world i udit kathuria the academy director would like to thank you dr gananaraj yusaidian on behalf of our gsm team and myself for this illuminating webinar thank you so much sir for teaching us what is global surgery and rural surgery the mind boggling facts about rural surgery globally the main concerns in rural surgery such as the accessibility and affordability and the ways in which we can improve the outcome of our patients we all must have absorbed a lot of information about global surgery i am sure indeed this activity would not be successful without the hard work of gsn working group and akatya vidushi the founder and president of global surgery network to sum it up i hope everyone has learned something from this astounding webinar again thank you very much to each and every one of you especially our guest speaker dr gananaraj for sharing his ideas and experiences regarding the topic thank you so much sir for your service to the community if you are not a member of gsn yet you can refer to the booklet and our ig page and other social media for the registration link and follow us on all major social medias for the upcoming webinars and events in surgery doctors create some wound so as to heal other wounds have a great night everyone thank you dr shamlan for moderating this great event so beautifully over to you thank you very much dr udit kathuria for those words so well now it's a photo time guys so could all the participants if you guys are comfortable with it to just turn on your camera for a brief photo session and ananya from academy team will take the shot so we'll give another 1 minute for those who haven't turned on your camera to do so Okay, maybe 30 more seconds don't be shy guys yeah i got it okay so uh we take one more let's go for freestyle guys it can be anything it can be mini hard so Ananya, I got the shot. Yes, yes, I got it. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, thank you guys. Thank you everyone for for turning on your camera for this brief photo session. So, before you leave, please spend some time to fill in the feedback form in the chat box to help us to conduct a better webinar in the future and to make yourself eligible for an ESET. Remember, this ESET is only will be given for JSN members only. Also, a huge, huge shout out. to the whole jason team who actually organized this fantastic webinar once again thank you very much for joining us if you haven't joined the global search network 
please do refer to our, our event booklet that has been attached in your email. Do reach us out if you have any feedback or comment. We are reachable through our IG, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, I would like to end the webinar with a quote by Dr. John Mira, the Director of Program of Global Surgery and Harvard Medical School. He said that surgery is a partner in healthcare. So it's not that surgery versus something else. You have to integrate surgery into an overall properly functioning healthcare system. With that saying, wishing you an amazing, amazing day for those in other time zones and hope to see everyone in our next event. Till then, bye and take care.